God bless you. God love you to everybody. We are excited and honored to have the Honorable District Elder Philip Johnson from Bay City, Michigan, join us this morning uh, just for a short interview about the importance of good leadership. Uh, we wanted to uh, have him come on just to talk with us about some various experience that he's had uh, dealing with leadership, being a pastor, and just asking him some questions when it pertains to this subject. We are always honored to have these great men and women of God join us for this segment. I believe this is segment number six. God has blessed us to be able to uh, reach those around the great country about this specific subject. I am Minister George Bowden III. I am the host or ministry leader of A Call to Be Different Ministries, and we're just here to serve the kingdom for such a time as this. I'm going to have uh, Pastor Philip Johnson introduce himself, and then we'll go ahead and get started this morning. Well, praise the Lord, everyone. Uh, it is a pleasure to be with you. Uh, pleasure to be here uh, with you, Elder Bolden, um, and for your audience. Um, we thank the Lord for uh, his blessings that he has bestowed on us. And um, for the time that I've served in the ministry, been honored to serve the ministry. And I am excited and humbled and honored to uh, just share my thoughts um, for whatever they're worth on what it means to uh, be a good leader and exercise good leadership in this generation. Um, this is, we're in the time of the Laodicea church age. Uh, this is the time where uh, things are progressively getting worse. And this, this spirit of self ent of entitlement, the spirit of self-righteousness, the spirit of self-adulation um, has enveloped the church today. And I, I think it is important for us to stay grounded on God's word, to stay grounded on what it means to be a good leader so that we can survive this period and make the rapture ultimately. So uh, I'm honored to be here. Thank you for having me. God bless you. And you're already preaching already. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we wanted to have Pastor Johnson come on. And as we talked before uh, we went on live on the broadcast, he mentions a name, Bishop Ira Combs, Bishop Radar Johnson, and some of the other greats that I know he's been associated with down through the years, Evangelist Naomi Cecily. But I wanted to, I'd like to get both sides of the story, uh, the older generation and then some of our younger preachers as well. But Pastor Johnson, the first question that I would like to ask you when it comes to this generation and time that we're living in now, why do you think our generation, when I say our generation, I guess maybe a couple generations under you, I'm 28, I don't know how old you are, but the generation um, now, why do you think that we have such a hard time submitting to leadership? Um, you know, I think that um, we have not received what has been handed off to us. It's not, you know, I, I, I bristle at our current generation. And we're, we're in the same generation. I'm 36. Okay. Uh, I bristle at, my, at our generation because we're constantly pointing the fingers uh, at the fathers and castigating and finding fault with 
uh, with the fathers were constantly talking about, um, you know, things that they handed down that weren't really Bible, that was just tradition and, and, uh, and a lot of things we have rejected. And I think that's probably one of the main issues uh, with this generation is that we have not received what our fathers and our, our mothers, the previous generation handed off to us. Not only that, um, we are a lot more informed than we have ever been. Um, there's a lot more information available. There's more information available now to this generation than, than all of the previous generations and histories of man combined. Um, and the scripture says that knowledge puffeth up. Um, there's, I mean, I can go into a whole host of a litany of issues. We have platforms now that has enabled us to build audiences um, and and puff us up, puff us up. And as a result, now we, we think that we're something. And, and I'm talking about this generation as a whole. Uh, I wasn't a direct student of, of Bishop R.P. Paddock, um, but the teachings of Bishop Paddock and others were put in me uh, by my father, Suffolk and Bishop Rader Johnson, um, my previous pastor, my current diocesan bishop, Bishop Ira Combs Jr., uh, my godfather, my uncle, uh, Bishop Timothy Owen Johnson in Montgomery, Alabama. One of the things that Bishop Paddock used to say is that most people either want to be original or nothing, and they wind up being both. And it's because we don't want to follow the pattern that was set before us. And so um, if I had one accusation or one uh, charge against this generation of preachers, it would be the charge that uh, that God had against the church of Laodicea in Revelation chapter number three. We are rich and increased with goods and feel like we have need of nothing, but not recognizing that we're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And the worst state is that we don't even know it. And so we're blinded to our own condition. And until we as a generation um, see ourselves in the light of God's word and come to see how God views us, uh, then we will never repent, we'll never change, and we'll just continue to get worse, unfortunately. And I don't mean to sound um, negative, but it's just the state of affairs for this generation. Right. And, and looking at, so looking at the time when you were a child and looking at your, yourself and even your children and family, how has church changed from when you seen your dad growing up preaching from you now pastoring? How has church altogether changed? Uh, people feel like it's not a necessity, that we don't need church um, in order to in order to be saved. Um, I think being saved has been redefined um, by by the culture. Being saved has been the idea of being saved has been redefined by um, this I, this this mindset of carnality. And um, you know, when I was growing up, um, there was I mean there was no question about it. You went to Sunday school. You got up and you went to Sunday school. Sunday school, my church, Great Byway Temple in Jackson, started at, uh, I think, I can't remember, I think it started at nine o'clock. Um, it was not an option. You know, we went to Sunday school. It was not an option. We went to Monday night uh, youth and unity. It was not an option. We were in Tuesday night Bible study. It was not an option. We were in Thursday night choir rehearsal at six o'clock and then prayer at eight o'clock. It was not an option that we were in Bible study on Friday nights at seven o'clock. And so nowadays people feel like they can be saved without the system of the church. Right. And you know, it, it's not the it's not just the building. I think the building is important, the fellowship of God's people is important, but it is what Bishop James Johnson called when Jesus said, I am the true vine, he was talking about the the church being the system of life. And we have disconnected ourselves because we feel like I can stay home, I can watch um, certain preachers on YouTube, I can watch, um, you know, now I'm a preachers on YouTube and still feed myself and get what I need in order to be saved. I think that that is the number one thing that is different about uh, our culture today is our attitude towards church, not recognizing that this is God's system. There this you is go. how he is working right. in this day. And my attitude towards church is my attitude towards God's system. And so if I'm going to disconnect from his system, I'm disconnecting from him. And, and that is the main issue with our generation today, um, among other things. That's good. That's good. That's wonderful. 
when we look at leadership today, what, what does good leadership look like to you? Well, um, I, I think good leadership um, is really the, the model of that Jesus uh, exemplified for us. Um, the scripture says that, uh, that he uh, took upon himself no reputation, but took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Um, I think that that servant leadership style is uh, the most desirable. I think it is the most fruitful style. Um, and I think in these times, because the needs of, of the individuals that we come in contact with are so diverse, um, that if we are going to be effective, we're going to have to lead with serving. Um, one of my, my father's favorite scripture that has become my uh, sort of life scripture in servant leadership is a scripture that says that the son, Jesus said, the son of man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Uh, later on in the book of First John, it would say that um, that um, hereby perceive we the love of God, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. That That's leadership. And, and really, when you get down to the very rock bottom of the matter, the word minister means servant. And right. so it is our responsibility as leaders to serve the people. And, you know, we, we have to lead with love. We have to lead with uh, genuine care and compassion. Multiple times in the scriptures, we see where Jesus saw the multitude, that they were without sheep. Uh, they were as sheep without a shepherd. The scripture says that he was moved with compassion. And uh, as I heard Bishop James, uh, Bishop Harry L. Herman say one time, that the basis upon which God even visited man, uh, the reason why he came was because of his love, because of his compassion, because of his, his willingness to forgive. And I, I think that all of that is wrapped up and bundled up in the way that we're supposed to lead in these times. We have to be servant leaders. We have to put the people first. Uh, I, I recognize in my secular career prior to pastoring, uh, I was a multi-unit manager, managed teams of, of multiple people across the state of Michigan. And I, I remember when I got promoted um, from a store manager to a district manager um, that uh, I tried to institute my idea of what a culture should be among a team, a work group. And I quickly found out that um, you cannot impose a new culture on the with the wrong people and so we had to recruit for the culture so the people were so critical to the culture and i understood and i came to understand and still understanding the importance of putting people first mm -hmm. and that translates uh, very well in, in in a church setting in, a, in the pastorate because you can't do anything without people and the people will serve God when they know that they are being served and that they, they are loved. So I would have to say that servant leadership is the most important style that we ought to embrace in these times. That's good. And you come from such a rich stock and mm -hmm. you were able to sit up under and hear, you know, uh, Bishop Combs and Bishop Harry L. Herman and your father and others. When we look at good leaders and the stock that you have come from, what are who are some of the leaders that you remember growing up that you were fond of their preaching, their teaching? I know you're not going to be able to name them all, but yeah. who are some of those people that come to mind when you think of good leadership, good pastors and all of that? Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, that, that list is, is not as long as you might think. Um, OK. <laughs> you know, um, so so I'll, I'll just give you a few names. Uh, my first pastor, Bishop Ira Combs, um, my family was was a part of Greater Bible Way Temple for 18 years. My father, uh, suffering Bishop Rader Johnson, met Bishop Combs when my father was 16 and Bishop Combs was 21. And um, my father tells the story of him um, going into the church. The church was real small. It was like a chicken shack. And uh, and Bishop, I think Bishop was painting or something, and he had Bishop Paddock's tape playing. He was teaching on apostolic roots. And uh, my father began to ask questions, and uh, over time he joined the church, became one of the original five members of the church. And, um, and so we sat under Bishop Combs. Uh, so I was born into 
Greater by Way Temple in Jackson, Michigan. Um, at around the age of 12 or 13, I began, I became serious about my salvation and my father began to train me. The Lord called me to preach at the age of 13. My father began to train me. And so yes. I, in Bible study, I would sit in the second row and with my notebook, um, I would wear a suit because my father wore a suit. Sure, sure. I would carry a briefcase because my father carried a briefcase. Right, right. Um, I, he bought me my first Bible. And so I was being taught by Bishop Combs and, and simultaneously I was being trained by my father. Um, my father then uh, ventured out, Lord called him the pastor here in Bay City. Uh, I was 14. And then I really got my ministerial training under my father's pastorate. Um, I watched, um, I was alongside him everywhere, and I got to see the good, the bad, um, the ugly side of ministry, the, the you know, from, from my vantage point, um, my father taught me how to preach, he taught me how to teach, he taught me how to counsel, he taught me how to care for God's people, he, he taught me how to minister. He taught me what ministry was all about. Ministry was all about serving. I remember when I uh, was first called to the ministry and um, he said, all right, let, we need to go talk to Elder Cones. Well, he was Elder Cones at the time, he's Bishop Cones now. And um, and so we went, he took me to Bishop Cones and, and we talked and I told him about the dream that I had and the Lord dealt with me the dream, the scripture that he uh, gave me confirm that God was calling me to the ministry. And so he then put me to work. He then put a Bible in my hand and a microphone. <laughs> sure, sure. And he said, here's some paper towel and some Windex. I want you to walk around this church and keep these windows clean. And so he taught me leadership. Uh, ministry was all about serving in the house of God. That's why I love the house of God to this day. And so I would say Bishop Ira Combs, uh, obviously, my father um, put everything in me that's in me. Um, Bishop Timothy Johnson, who is my godfather, uh, my uncle is my, uh, it's not my biological uncle, sure. but he and my father are like blood brothers. And so he's my godfather, but I call him about anything. I've watched him and learned from him uh, through proximity. Um, and then some of the leaders that they have exposed me to, well, some of the leaders that my father has exposed me to, the teachings of Bishop Paddock, the teachings of Bishop Harry Herman, the teachings of Bishop Morris E. Golder, um, the teachings of Bishop G.T. Haywood, the teachings of Bishop Carl F. Smith, our apostolic fathers, yes. they put their teachings in me. And so... Uh, there are other leaders that that uh, that I have gleaned from, but they are the the three uh, that are the most perennial in my life. That's good. That's wonderful. You you are a blessed man. I am blessed. <laughs> you yeah, are very blessed. I, I I am very blessed because the thing about truth and the thing about the Word of God rightly divided, it it helps you to see, uh, it helps you to identify and delineate between truth and, mm -hmm. and, and nonsense. There you okay. go. Uh, between meat and um, I like to call cotton candy. You know, right. not everybody's teaching the word is giving out meat. Some of it's just cotton candy. You know, right. cotton candy <laughs> tastes good for about two seconds and then mm -hmm. it resolves. Right. Um, you know, it helps you to understand, it helps you identify false doctrine. Mm -hmm. It helps you identify um, what is what is just somebody's opinion. And, and what the teaching, the exposure to the fathers and their leadership and their, their uh, teachings has done for me, it has um, engendered within me a love for the truth. Good. And my father used to say, and he still says all the time, when you love the truth, you will never be deceived. Wow. And it is so unfortunate, it is so unfortunate that this generation um, rejects, uh, just outright rejects the, uh, from my perspective, rejects the teachings of, of our father. It is so unfortunate because as a result, we're not theologically sound. Uh, as a result, we, we are um, following men and writings of men that don't know God, 
Right. And it is an unfortunate thing and it has crept into the church and it, it has poisoned us from the inside out. And so um, that's a long answer, but those those three um, are perennial leaders in my life. They still influence my ministry to this day. And that's good that you said that because a lot of people, they don't even know what sound doctrine is. Mm -hmm. They don't either, either, they don't understand the truth of the word. Right. And I told somebody it's easy to get a mic and hoop and walk the pews and do all these things. But if nobody gets uh, baptized in Jesus name and nobody's receiving the Holy Ghost, I mean, it's just a big show. Absolutely. So that's why it's important to be under good leadership, men and women that will be able to stand on the truth no matter what. And you just got to move and go forward from there. One point that I like that you said, Bishop Combs, put some paper towels and some Windex in your hand. You, di you didn't get upset or leave the church because Bishop Combs didn't say, okay, next Sunday night, I'm going to have you up to preach. Can you dive into a little bit about how young leaders should just submit and work in the church before they want to go preach in the pulpit? Well, if, you, if you're really called, um, Bishop Herman said that 90% of all preachers that said that they called to preach are not called. If you're really called, <laughs> right? Um, I think it was Bishop Paddock who said, uh, and, I, and I'm expanding on this statement, he said, God's people, and I mean God's people, will do what is right when they know what is right, and they'll only know what is, what is right as they have been taught. And I'll have to apply that to ministers. Ministers will do what is right when they know what is right. And so if they're really called, they'll come to understand that the call of God does not mean go. The call of God means come here. I see. Because I, you can't go until you have been prepared, you have been trained. And the training ground for ministry is working in the church. Mm -hmm. um, I washed windows and mopped floors and scraped concrete off of the floors when we were when they were building the new gymnasium in Jackson um, before I ever picked up a microphone and preached. As a matter of fact, um, um, when I got to Bay City, I didn't preach. My father didn't put me up to do anything other than play the keyboard um, for about, I think, probably for the first six to seven years. Uh, I was in training. I was in training. And um, so I learned how to paint before hmm. I, I really learned how to hold an altar call. You know, <laughs> wow. I, I learned how to cut grass. Good. And um, and I didn't know at the time I was just being submitted. OK, sure. I, I was just doing what I was told to do. Sure. Um, what that did for me is that developed that helped me to develop a love for not just God, his people, but his church, the institution, the system. Uh, I would get off the bus every day um, in, 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 in middle school. I would ride the I would ride the school bus home get off the school bus, drop my backpack at the door at home, and then hop on the city bus and go down to the church to, to do my duties, to do my job, uh, to wash the windows, to dust or whatever. I remember one time, uh, I tell this story often, that um, uh, I, you know, I was in church with Bishop, Bishop's son, we were the same age, and his nephew. And uh, uh, we shared a lot of classes together. One day, his nephew came to church, uh, came to school, and said, "Man, my uncle gave me forty dollars." Mm -hmm. I said, "Forty dollars?" <laughs> you know, we, we were in uh, seventh grade at the time. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Penny Hardaway's were uh, were the hot shoe at the time. Okay. I okay. said, forty dollars." <laughs> yeah. What did you do to get forty dollars? He all right. said, "Man, all I did was um, I, uh, I I dusted the podium." Mm -hmm. okay. I said, "Bet." I'm, I'm doing that today. <laughs> so I, I got home, hopped yeah. off the school bus, mm -hmm. dropped my bag at the door, hopped mm -hmm. on the city bus, ran mm -hmm. down to the church, mm -hmm. and, uh, and and I grabbed the Windex, the pledge, and I went to town. I, I dusted and, and polished the podium. Uh, Bishop had this big chair. He still has it today. Yeah. I, I wiped that chair down, but I, I went even further. I took all of the chairs out of the pulpit, all the choir chairs, and I vacuumed the whole pulpit. Okay, mm -hmm. and then um, the following Sunday, I went up to Bishop Combs, and uh, I said, "Elder Combs, uh, I did some work in the church. Um, I'd like to get paid because he." Was <laughs> <laughs> so he he said, "Well, what did you do?" And mm -hmm. I said, well, "This is what I did. I ran yeah. out the list of everything that I did, mm -hmm. and he and he reached into his pocket and he pulled out two dollars." Wow. And I went home and I, I went home crying. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I cried to my father. I said, he gave he gave his nephew $40 on mm-hmm. and gave him $2. Mm-hmm. My father said, let that be a lesson to you. You don't I serve see. in the ministry for money. You yeah. serve in the ministry because you love the Lord. Wow. And I never asked him for a dime since. I still haven't Good. asked him for a dime. Good. And it helped me to develop a healthy love um, and to serve for the right reasons. And so, good. you know, my father trained me. You never asked to preach. You yeah. never ask anybody to let you preach. Yeah. Never ask anybody to let you do anything. Mm-hmm. You just show up and be available. Mm-hmm. And uh, I thank God I've never had to ask anybody to let me preach. And, and doors have been open for me um, because of that. So, right. you know, if we can just grab hold of this idea that we are servants first, um, then you'll never have to beg for an opportunity. That's good. That that's a funny story. (laughs) (laughs) Because we we have to make it up in our minds that we're doing this for God. That's right. And and it reminds me of a story a pastor said he was gonna call me to preach. I I had to be I think I was in ninth grade. I wrote him a big check. I think 150 bucks. Uh-huh. Uh, Pastor Johnson, he still hasn't called me. Wow. <laughs> but that taught me a lesson. Yes, sir. Let God open up the doors. He'll make the way. That's right. That's <laughs> but he right. did cast the check, though. Oh, he did cast the check. <laughs> I'm sure he did. <laughs> but to our next question, this is good. And thank you to all of our viewers that are watching now. And later, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow uh, District Elder Philip Johnson at Apostolic Life Church of Bay City, where he is doing great things. I just want to take the time to say thank you to everybody and praise the Lord. So the next few questions that we have, we won't be long on this afternoon. Uh, Pastor Johnson, tell us the time uh, that you that you remember when you got saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. Yeah, I was, um, I got saved, I was seven years old, and, um, you know, in, in, in Jackson, uh, Bishop Combs used to have evangelist Naomi Cecily um, every year, and um, and I, I remember the, the year she came, uh, I was seven years old, my younger brother, a year younger than me, he passed away in 2004, um, he had gotten Holy Ghost on Friday night, and um I, I was, I remember I was kneeling at, at the chair. He was sitting in a chair speaking in tongues. My mother was there, Evangelist Susty was, was there. And uh, she had tarried with him to receive the Holy Ghost. Good. And, uh, and, and, and I felt some type of way because I was older. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, I, and I hadn't received the Holy Ghost. And so she was there on Saturday and they were, we had a Saturday morning um, Holy Ghost seminar and so I, I said, I told my father, I said, I'm, I'm going to church to get the Holy Ghost today. Thank you, Jesus. And, um, and so he said, all right. So we went to the service and I sat on the front row and I said, I'm here to get the Holy Ghost and told Evangelist Cecily, I'm here because I want to get the Holy Ghost. I'm seven years old. And uh, she turned with me, told me to lift my hands. And because my mind was made up, even at yes. that young age, God filled me with the baptism of the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues. The spirit of God gave up. And, um, um, and I remember one of the ministers at the time, he's, he said, uh, what happened? I said, I got the Holy Ghost. He said, how do you know? I said, I spoke in time. I said, all right. Amen. And so, um, so, that, so that's when I got the Holy Ghost. And, you know, and I thank God for the ministry of Evangelist Naomi Susley. She's been to Bay City um, a couple different times and um, has worked with numbers of individuals in our church and in my father's pastor. And, you know, God bless her. I hope she lives forever. I, I really do. Yes, I hope you yes, live yes. forever because yes. the effectiveness of her ministry, the, her ability to take her time and build up faith in the heart of the person, uh, in the heart of the candidate is is unlike anything I've ever seen. And right. so um, so I thank the Lord. I, I don't know if I'd be saved without her ministry. Wow. And when you talk about Pastor Naomi Cecily in my time at Church of Christ, I was I was born at that church until mm-hmm. uh, I left after Dr. Lundy retired. But I remember, and I was telling my mother this the other day, I said, when Sister Cecily, there was a group of us young ministers uh, that would go out and preach and teach and baptize. And she would call us in, we would take her out to dinner, and we would just glean for her, glean from her. And I'm like, uh, Pastor Cecily, what about this? Just, I said, I got the meal. I'll pay for everybody. We need to hear this. <laughs> But I told my mom at times, I look back at times, pastor, I thought it was boring. Some of the stuff 
that Ooh. she was telling me about how to carry myself, how to be a preacher, how to be a minister, how to preach in the pulpit, how to conduct myself. I'm like, that's what successfully. I got mm -hmm. this. I got this. Before my first sermon, I had gum in my mouth, Ooh. and she was there on the front row, and she oh. looked. And after <laughs> lack of training, you know, they gave me an opportunity. I was not prepared at the time. Sure. I came off the pulpit. She had a napkin. She said, spit out your gum. And she yeah. said, study more. You was all over the place. Wow. <laughs> but it was people like her. You you need people like Pastor Cecily and others that have been around the country that know about preaching and teaching that mm -hmm. you, she told me straight up, study more and don't put gum in your mouth. Yeah. But her ministry, I talk to people all the time. And the first name they mention is Evangelist Dr. Naomi Cecily. Mm -hmm. I did not know how worldwide she was until I began to branch out and talk to other people. Mm -hmm. But her ministry is like none other. Yeah, it's powerful. I, I um, She was here in 2000 and let me see, this is what I think she was here in 2014. Um, she came and we had. I think like 14 people get the Holy Ghost and in two wow. days it was just tremendous. Wow. Um, and and I I remember having a conversation with her. I said, uh, Evangelist Susley, uh, I uh, I think the Lord is calling me to pastor. Mm -hmm. And she said, Son, you need to get uh, Carl F. Smith's book on the Christian pastor. Wow. And I, I went out and got my, actually my father had it. So I, I, I took his copy mm -hmm. and, and I, I think I've read through that book probably six or seven times wow. and the, the amount of wisdom, you see, that was, that was, um, Evangelist Cecily's pastor. That's correct. Yes. And, um, Car Bishop Carl F. Smith was probably one of the few men that Bishop Paddock really confided in wow. and because of his wisdom. He was a he had a wellspring of wisdom, and it is uh, it's really captured in the book the Christian Pastor. So, if there's any young ministers watching and you feel like there's a, a call in your life to um, do more and and to lead, I would strongly encourage you to get that book the Christian Pastor. Uh, Evangelist Cecily practically put it in my hand. Wow, and that's good because I don't see and, and, and I hope any. I hope nobody take offense to this. I don't see anybody of her statue or her effectiveness to keep going. I, I don't see that in our mm -hmm. in our churches nowadays. I mean, countless souls. Yeah. Somebody was telling me of a time, maybe it was the pastor before uh, Suffolk and Bishop uh, Raider Johnson mm -hmm. uh, down where he is now, or maybe it was a few pastors before uh, where your dad is now. Mm -hmm. They said that her and uh, Bishop Howard Tillman came mm. down, he preached, and she was witnessing, and she just told everybody on two rows, lift your hands if you want the Holy Ghost. Yeah. They told me the whole rows, people start receiving the Holy Ghost, and I'm just like, wow, yeah. that's amazing. God has truly gifted her. Yeah, she is um, She is a treasure. And, you know, I, I don't know if we really appreciate the effectiveness of her ministry like yeah. we ought to. Yeah. Um, and I think the beautiful thing about Evangelist Cecily is she does not even care. Yeah, she doesn't. <laughs> I was I was watching a, um, a an interview that um, um, uh, Bishop uh, Harold Rayford did with Evangelist. Cecily. Yes, yes, at the church. Yes, yeah. and yeah. I sent that, I sent that out to all of our ministers. I said, man, this good. is required viewing. Yeah. This is good, required. good. <laughs> You know, we, we, because she and I said, not just our ministers, but all of our altar workers, yeah. this is required. And um, the last few minutes, I think the beauty of Evangelist Cecily's ministry is captured in the last few minutes. Yeah. Because she 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 was so meek, so humble yeah. uh, in the interview. And then when there was a soul yeah. that was seeking the Holy Ghost, yeah. it was like she flipped the switch. Yeah. And she, she just, and not to say that she wasn't there in the interview but she's just so humble right. but when she was working with that soul she was like a totally different person she was said, Man, this this is this is required viewing for all of yeah. our ministers all of our altar workers i think that everybody watching uh if you have a burden for souls you need to go and find that video on youtube yes, and yes, watch yes. it because it her her the explain the explanation how she uh, outlined her ministry over the years who poured into her and then how she works with souls. 
-hmm. is absolutely extraordinary. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we really appreciate her to the level that we should. Um, but if this was the Catholic Church, we would definitely make her a saint. Because <laughs> she, she is, she is, she's at that level. Most definitely. People, she told me one time, all over the country have called her on their phones. I want the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. uh, her and uh, Evangelist Robinson, I believe, yeah. they used to go up to Jackson with Bishop Combs. Yeah. And I know many times they went down with your dad. So yep. God bless her successfully. Yeah. Uh, like you said, she is a person. God let her live until the end of time. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, because, because we know she's still going to be working with souls, you know. Until her day life. is done. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> this is good. See, our next question to you is, seeing that you are a pastor of a multicultural and multi-generational church, how has that helped you as a leader serving people from all demographics and ages? Yeah, you know, it, it, it has helped me to be um, sensitive to, to where people are. Um, and, you know, I, I try to be a, um, a, a, a unifier. I think a leader is supposed to bring people together. There's so much, there's so, there's so much out there that divides us. Um, you know, doctrine divides us. The, the idiosyncrasies of doctrine divide us. Um, Politics is polarizing. You know, you know we, we are in a politically charged environment um, and we just can't get away from it. Um, there's, there's so much that divides us. I think a leader is supposed to be one that brings people together. And pastoring um, a diverse group of people ha has taught me to be sensitive to the needs of everybody. And it really has taught me to, to lead with, with love. Uh, I remember having a conversation with Bishop Charles H. Ellis a um, couple years ago when we, we got into our new building and uh, the Lord blessed us to get, get into our building um, and we didn't have to pay anything for it. Um, and uh, he, he gave me some wisdom about making sure that the people know that you love them. And he said, everybody around you, make sure you know, make sure they know that you love them. If you love them, they'll do anything for you. Mm -hmm. And and I have found that to be true. And so I think that the most important thing that a leader can do in pastoring a diverse group of people is to just love them and understand that um, the scripture says God has dealt according to every man a measure of faith. Not everybody's at the same level, and, and that's all right. Uh, not everybody um, has this thing figured out. And, and that's all right, too. Right. Um, I, you know, I talk to our leaders all the time about respecting where people are, honoring where people are and and bringing them bringing them up. And I think that's what mentorship and, and leadership is really all about. Um, pastoring a diverse group of people has has helped me, has has taught me um, to um, to respect people's backgrounds, too. Um, because in some, so many times we 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 have this tribalism mentality uh, in the church right. that um, because I've always been apostolic anything anything other than that is um, is not even worth having a conversation. When we we have to recognize that you know my father used to say that there is some level of truth in every denomination. Right. You know, it's just that we as apostolics. We believe we have more of the truth than any other denomination. And it is respecting where people are. And so I, I've never won anybody by, by beating them up. No, I've never, <laughs> right. never won anybody by disrespecting them. Um, but I have won people by understanding where they are, loving them through it, and helping show them a better way, what I believe to be a better way. And so I, I thank God that he has blessed us with uh, diversity in our church. Um, you know, I would love to take credit for it, but I really can't because when my father came to this city um, back in 98, he prayed and told the Lord, he said, Lord, um, I don't want an all black church. He said, I will not stand for an all black church. I want a diverse church. Good. And the church was diverse under my father's leadership. Wow. Um, and when we have just strived to build upon that diversity and the Lord has blessed us. Um, you know, many people say that that uh, white folks won't follow a black pastor, mm -hmm. and and I don't believe that to be true. I, when 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 the the pastor doesn't lead with his 
with his blackness um, or, or the Caucasian class, it doesn't lead with their whiteness because at the end of the day, none of that even matters anymore. Right. You know, and so, um, so I think that it, it has helped me to keep the main thing, the main thing, and that is loving God's people. Because there's one language that we all speak. We all speak the language of, I just want to be loved. I right. just want to be treated right. That, that's good. That's powerful. And, and that's good that God has enabled you to lead, you know, a diverse group of people. Because sometimes people, they don't know how to meet people where there are. Like you said, a lot of people uh, believe that, you know, if it's not Acts 238, I don't want to hear. It. Yeah, right. but it's it's just important for us just to to move forward and do what God has told us to do. Yeah, another, another thing, you know, um, the the Lord uh, um, called me to minister in in the jails. Okay. And, um, um, so I'm the chaplain in our local jail. I'm nice. the chaplain in the jail and for the sheriff's office, and I'm also the chaplain for our public safety our police department wow. and fire and rescue um and and so the lord taught me early in my pastorate um that i have to meet people where they are mm -hmm. and and there's i think the the there's one place in a city where all the needs the spiritual needs of individuals no matter what their background is converges on one place and that's jail um, you got all kinds of people with all kinds of background, and it really taught me how to minister. It taught me that um, that you know, I don't want to get too deep in it, but it taught me that there's all kinds of trauma and experiences that people have have come through that have shaped them and molded them into what they are today, good or bad. Mm -hmm. And what I learned, I learned this from talking to. 60 year old men who after five minutes of a conversation with them realized that i was actually talking to the seven-year-old or the 10-year-old boy yes yes and what it what i learned is that many people i think i heard bishop td jake say this that many people suffer for 40 and 50 years in their life over what happened to them within the first 10 to 15 years mm -hmm. and the reason why is because most people get stuck at the point of their trauma they get frozen at the point of their trauma. And so if it was seven years old, if it was 10 years old, if it was 12 years old, they're right. frozen at that point. And so I, they may be 40 and 50 and 60 years old still with this mentality because they're frozen at the point of their trauma. I've got to understand that if I'm going yeah. to minister to people. There and it's go. not just individuals who are um, still living with trauma, it's, it's everybody. And so the Lord taught me that um, I've got to meet people where they are and not shun them for being where they are, but help show them the way of God more perfectly like Aquila and Priscilla did with Apollos and, and God would do the rest. That's wonderful. Like you said, all people need Jesus. And that mm -hmm. not that that topic of trauma and what, meeting people where they are, that would be a whole nother discussion mm -hmm. because that a lot of people are stuck on what happened 15, 25 years ago, and they just got to move forward in their mind. I remember at the altar working, a lady told me that her husband left her in the 60s, mm. and she still had everything the same at home, mm. same drape, same this. And I told her, I, I said, I'm not the pastor. I'm not your counselor. But I said, you need to move on. I'm 20, <laughs> 22, 23 is just like. But you that's the trauma. That's where yeah. she's at in her mind. And it, it, it's going to take God to to move her along. Yeah. My next question to you is how can we reach a generation that's all about TikTok, social media? You know, now people are saying that they want to be virtual. They may not want to go back to church. Maybe their church hasn't uh, opened back up. How, how do you continuously reach that generation? Well, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, the, the church today has to um, embrace um, certain technologies and certain platforms, recognizing that man inherently is a corrupter. Sure. Um, that um, I think Bishop Carl F. Smith said that man is inherently a corrupter, um, that anything he touches, he messes up. Right. And, you know, so things like the internet, there's some, some pastors. Oh, that's the devil. 
you know, mm-hmm. well, it's not that the internet is the devil, is that man is inherently a corrupter. Right. And so it's not that um, Facebook or TikTok um, or Snapchat or, or these or these other sites, these platforms are the devil. It's just that when man touches it, he, he corrupts it. It can be used for good and it can be used for, for bad. And I think that because there are so many uh, content, uh, um, uh, um, so many individuals who are leveraging these platforms for evil and wicked and ungodly means, that we have to warn the people, especially our young people. Yes. We have to warn them on the dangers. We have to educate parents, and then parents have to be diligent right. about checking and following up and not trusting um, that their children are not being corrupted. And then we as the church, I don't think there's anything wrong with using these platforms to preach the gospel. I don't think there's anything wrong with using these platforms to to reach out. Um, And so I I think that if you have the wherewithal, um, if you have the skill set to effectively use um, Instagram, TikTok, um, to promote your church, I, I think you should. I, I think we, we've got to understand that these platforms are not social media platforms. These are advertising platforms. There you go. Okay. Right. Well, these are ad- Facebook is an advertising platform. And um, when I when I took over as, as pastor, um, I've got a background in marketing. And so we started to leverage Facebook for paid advertising, not just boosting a post, but I'm talking about targeted paid advertising. And within the first two years, we saw 350 new people walk through the doors of our church for the first time. Uh, We've been there for 18 years, but because we started advertising on Facebook, targeted ads in our city, um, it started to reach the people that we that we wanted to reach. And so I think that there's, there has to be an awareness on the part of our leaders that these social media sites are advertising platforms. Mm-hmm. That you can pay for ads on Instagram. You can pay for ads uh, on, on um, TikTok. You can target and micro-target the people in your community to see your stuff to get them out to church. And right. so we, we've got to we've got to approach this from how do we leverage these sites that the devil is leveraging? Mm-hmm. How do how do we leverage them for our purpose? How do we then warn our young people on the dangers? And how do we equip our parents to protect their young people as best as they can? And so we've got to we've got to take a look at it from a broad spectrum, and then uh, and then act accordingly. That's good because, you know, I tell people all the time, if it wasn't for social media and, you know, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, some of these uh, segments I probably wouldn't have access to. Mm -hmm. I don't think we probably would met if it wasn't for social media and then, you know, networking words of uh, recommendation from other preachers and stuff. So, you know, you have to use it for the good and then build the kingdom from there. And, and and let me, let me make a distinction, Doc, because um, you know we know the ones who are promoting Jesus, and we know the ones who are promoting themselves. There you go. And you know, you, yeah, you can use it to build your brand. I mm-hmm. mean, yeah, you can use it to make money if you want to um, uh, promote yourself, and you know, you can use it for that. If that's what you choose to do. I choose to use this platform to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what God called me to do. And, you know, the pandemic, through the pandemic, the Lord, um, you know, we we were streaming before the pandemic. Okay. And, um, you know, so that transition, we we, uh, limited in person for eight weeks. Um, During that time, the transition from in person to streaming was was fluid for us because we had our, we were streaming anyway, mm-hmm. um, you know, so, but the Lord, and I'll share this, I shared this in Bible study a couple of weeks ago, the Lord um, impressed upon my heart at the beginning of the pandemic um, about the c- continuing to teach and preach. And he reminded me of the story of Eli, um, who was the high priest and his sons uh, were the under priest. 
and mm -hmm. in the days of Eli, his sons were wicked. They were Bel right. the sons of Belial. The Bible says they were um, robbing the sacrifices. They were pillaging the sacrifices, and they were sleeping with the women that came to the temple. And the scripture says, uh, and ere the lamp of God went out, talking about the seven golden candlesticks inside yes. the tabernacle that the priests were supposed to keep lit. And, you know, we understand the seven golden candlesticks uh, in our day represents the light of the word of God. David mm -hmm. said, my word is a lamp unto my feet and light unto my path. God reminded me of that scripture and ere the lamp of God went out and he told me, you better not let the light go out Jesus. in my house. And so I had to teach. I had to, we turned the camera on and I taught light for living. Um, every, I, I taught, I think I taught three days and recorded three days of light for living every single week. We continue to have service. And, you know, as a result, people began, uh, the audience grew and people be, uh, started joining the church. And we have had individuals, I'm not talking about joining in terms of being an E-member. I don't know what, right. you know, uh, I'm talking about invested, join, serving, and save. And we've had That's individuals good. from uh, upwards to two hours away that drive to the church every weekend to be wow. a part of the service because they started watching online. And I, I don't attribute that to any greatness on my part. I attribute that to... God saying, you better not let the light go out. Jesus, and because Jesus. I don't want God to get me. Yeah. I said, yes, Lord. <laughs> I know that's right. Wow. That, that's amazing because uh, when, when you look at leadership, the importance of good leadership, and this can sum up the whole interview, mm -hmm. hearing from God. Mm -hmm. Now you could have went and taught and, you know, told everybody you coming out, grab your neighbor by your hand. We going to do this. We going to do that. But God told you specifically, get right. on there, teach, let the people know that God is still in control and keep the fire, keep the light of God burning. That That's a blessing. That's a blessing. This is so encouraging to me. Yes, sir. So our last uh, question before we go. Or, I or your final thoughts, any words of wisdom for the next generation of preachers, teachers coming up behind you, or just any words of encouragement to our audience listening? Yeah, so if, if I'm talking to apostolic ministers, um, I would really encourage all of our young preachers, ministers, young pastors to teach no other doctrine. I know that's right. Yeah, we don't need, uh, we don't have use for anything that is tangential to the apostolic message. Um, and further, don't compromise your apostolic identity um, to get the crowds and the adulation and admiration of people. I think the only thing worse, and this is just my opinion, the only thing worse than a false prophet is an apostolic minister that has compromised. Mm -hmm. um, because what it does, if I am, if I'm an apostolic pastor and I've got Baptist people coming to preach for me or Trinitarians coming to preach for me and we all shout and have a good time, what that communicates to the people is that there's no difference and that I don't have to adhere to the apostolic message. I don't have to adhere to the tenets of holiness in order to shout and have a good time. And that's going to be on the people, but God's going to hold the apostolic ministers accountable to that. Right. And so how do we ward that off? We ward that off by teaching no other doctrine no other, other doctrine. than the apostolic message, which is not just Acts 2.38. Yes. It is also, it, the apostolic message is summed up in Hebrews chapter number six, verses one and two. Repentance from dead works, faith toward God, doctrine of baptisms, laying on the hands, resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. The apostolic doctrine is not just Jesus only, is not just baptism in Jesus' name, but it yes. is also holiness. It is also the tenets of holy living. That is the doctrine that we have to stick to. That is the doctrine that was good enough to save us. And if it was good enough to save us, it's good enough to keep us. Yes, sir. And we cannot compromise because the people... They'll praise you one day and they'll cuss you out the next day. Yes. <laughs> you know, 
they'll, they'll praise you one day and they'll want to crucify you the next day. Yeah. And so we better just be obedient, teach no other doctrine and stay true to who we are as apostolic ministers. Wow. That's amazing. Pastor, it looks like somebody wants to send you an offering. How can they do that? Uh, that's Aaron Jonathan, that's, that's my brother. He, uh, he, he, he can just cash at me personally, the money yes. that he owes me. And then I know that's right. You an <laughs> <laughs> Make it right. <laughs> yeah, that's, no, that, that's, that's, that's my baby brother. Uh, okay. Wonderful. He's the drummer in our church. So wonderful. Wonderful. Yes. Sir. Wonderful. This is excellent. I have truly enjoyed myself. I wish I could uh, <laughs> uh, keep Pastor on for a little bit longer, but we want to respect everybody's time. Again, I want to thank uh, Pastor Philip Johnson and his time and everybody who tuned in, stayed on. This is a blessing to me. As I said, please subscribe to our YouTube channel for interviews, uh, other uh, ministry events that we are doing. Again, I want to thank Pastor Johnson for coming on and trusting me enough <laughs> to be on our platform this morning. So we just thank God for everything that he's doing. I'm going, Pastor Johnson, could you close us out with prayer and then we'll end our broadcast? Yeah. Uh, th thanks so much, man. Um, fascinating interview. I really appreciate the uh, questions and I I hope and pray that there was something of value said yes, sir. Um, that can benefit uh, not just the church as a whole, but also up and coming ministers. So I yes. really appreciate it. I'm very humbled. Yes. Um, you know, I'm not trying to be anything great. I'm just trying to um, do my part and serve God and be obedient. So I thank you for this opportunity. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you right now for the uh, brother Bolden, Lord, Lord, Elder Bolden, oh God, this platform that you have given him. Oh Lord, uh, this very it's very special, it's very unique, oh God, because we're not just uh, talking about the apostolic doctrine, but we're talking about the construct of your ministry yes. and how it how it is relevant still to this generation that uh, seemingly as a whole has turned us back on you. I ask, oh God, that you would help us to overcome the spirit of Laodicea, that you would bless us to remain diligent and faithful to our calling that you would inspire us, O oh God, to teach no other doctrine, O oh Lord, and that we would resist the urges and the forces of compromise, but seek to sully and muddy and murky the apostolic message in these times. I pray right now, God, that you will continue to strengthen all of our leaders, our fathers and our mothers that are still with us. Give them longevity, O oh God, the precious evangelist Naomi Cecily, Lord. Give her longevity. We thank you for giving her to us. Oh, Lord, we pray that you will continue to, to sustain her. Bless Elder Bolden right now in this call to be different ministry. We thank and praise you for all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you. And Brother Aaron, send that money to your brother so you can be blessed, not yes. by him, but Amen. by God. <laughs> God bless you all. Thank you.